Thank you everybody for showing up to Living Abroad with the Global Ambassadors. Um, we're just gonna do like a presentation and then Q&A style. Um, our ambassadors are gonna talk about their experiences living abroad or moving abroad. Um, and I'm just gonna give a little introduction about who we are. So Global Ambassadors, we really work to engage students in different cultures, uh, whether that's, you know, introducing international students to, you know, more cultures here or introducing our students to cultures abroad. Um, and especially with the pandemic and everything going on, we wanted to focus an event on what it's like to live abroad, even though it's kind of hard to do that now. Um, so I'm Paige Baxter. I'm an intern with the Office of Global Engagement, and I work in marketing and event planning. Um, and I was an ambassador last year. I'm an English creative writing major and a mathematics minor. And so our ambassadors are now just going to give a little brief introduction of themselves. Okay, so my name is Gabriella. I'm a senior in international studies and business admin. This is my second year as a global ambassador, and I've also worked for the Passport Office on campus, and I'm in the Alexander Hamilton Scholars Program. Hey guys, um, I'm Enzo. I'm a sophomore majoring in chemistry and biology. It's my first year being a global ambassador, and I'm also in charge of um, working with the IEP, so the Intensive English Program. So, um, nice to meet you guys. Hi guys, um, my name is Valentina Vanderwarden and um, I'm a senior, I'm about to graduate this semester. Um, I'm studying political science um, with a concentration in international. I have a minor in French um, and I also, uh, do the intensive English program and I'm involved in, I've been a global ambassador also for, I think about two years, a year and a half now. Um, my name is Asher Zhang. I'm currently a junior and I study sociology and psychology. Um, it's my first year as a global ambassador. All right, great. So, um... Yeah, so we're just going to go ahead and get started. We're going to kind of go through our different ambassadors and they're going to uh, share their stories about uh, being abroad or moving abroad. And then at the end of each, they're going to accept a couple questions. So you guys feel free to ask questions in the chat um, and they're going to pick a few of those to address after their little uh, session. And then we're leaving plenty of time at the end for people to uh, ask more questions. Uh, we really would just want this to be an open time. So yeah, without further ado, we're just going to get started. Okay, so I know I just introduced myself, but I'm going to introduce myself again. Um, my name is Gabriella. I'm a senior. I'm in my fourth year. I'm double majoring in international studies and business. I also have a minor in Spanish, and my study abroad program that I did was a language and culture in Valencia, and it was a five-week summer program with NC State. So I'm going to get to tell you guys about my experience with an NC State group program study abroad and what it was like living abroad for me. So these are a few pictures from my study abroad experience. Important things to know before you are living abroad is that you're going to need to adapt to a different cuisine, a different language, and an entirely different way of, like, way of life than what you're used to. So with my experience, we lived with host families, and so me and one other NC State student lived with our host mom who spoke absolutely no English, and it was very important that we respected the rules of the home and understood that we were in her home and had to go by her rules, and yeah. So breakfast every day in our host house was we had two little, honestly, a little bit bland muffins every morning, but that was a consistent every morning breakfast for us. Lunch was usually a sandwich that she would wrap up and we would take to school with us. We were in class from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. every day, but that wasn't a problem because in Spain, the days are very long. And so the sun rises, especially in the summer, the sun rises at 6.45 in the morning, but it doesn't set until 9.45 p.m., so almost 10 p.m. 
and dinner was also at 9 30 or 10 p.m our host mom understood that eating dinner at 10 p.m was a big difference for us so sometimes she would give me and my housemate our own little small dinner in the kitchen at 9 30 before she ate at 10. so that was really sweet of her and so food wise if you look at the picture in the bottom left that's paella paella actually originated in valencia so you were able to eat a lot of really good authentic paella that was the chicken one and it also has rabbit in it so i got to try rabbit for the first time so that's another thing about when it comes to the cuisine in a different um country you really have to be open to trying new things because you never know what you might like and i ended up loving it although my favorite paella was actually seafood paella so that was really good and so seafood was also very popular in Spain because they we were right on the Mediterranean in the city that we were in and so all the seafood was very fresh really good and then if you look on the opposite side the bottom right that's sangria I'm sure a lot of you have heard about sangria and during the five weeks that we were there we made sure to have as much as we could because it's just you can't find it as good anywhere else and so now I'll direct you to the bottom middle picture. Um, a really important thing when you're living abroad is to pay attention to all of the architecture around you. So these European countries were built so much longer before um, a lot of the buildings here were built. And so there's a lot of really interesting architecture that you can see. And so that bottom middle picture was from a mosque and cathedral that we went to. It's actually the third largest mosque in the world and it was converted to a Christian cathedral in the 13th century. So it has a mix of both the Muslim and the Christian aspects in it. So it was really neat to see like the whole thing put together and how it was built over centuries. I thought that was really interesting. But if you look at the top left picture, that's the city of arts and sciences, which is a very futuristic type part of the city. And so it was very recently built, very futuristic type looking. If you guys have ever seen the movie Tomorrowland, some scenes from Tomorrowland were actually filmed right there in the city of arts and sciences. So it was cool to go from like the very historic parts of the city all the way over to the most modern parts of the city. And so another important thing about Spanish culture is siesta. And so a lot of the businesses will close during the middle of the day, during the lunchtime hours, because the days are so long. So everyone kind of gets a break in the middle of the day. And I know it was fairly common for me to come back at 1 p.m. I would have my lunch, take a nap, wake up. I would still have time to do homework, maybe grab drinks before dinner, and then finally go into bed. So very long days. And what I would say is make sure that you take advantage of all of the time that you have in another country because we were only there for five weeks, but we made sure to get in as much as we could. And then the last picture is just of the flamenco dancing. And so we got to go to um, a really cool show and we had a glass of sangria with our ticket, which was pretty cool. And Asher, if you wanna go to the next slide. Okay, so my advice to you living abroad is to learn as much as you can about the country that you're going to before you go. And if you're staying with a host family, know and respect their rules. So in the bottom left picture, that's a picture actually of the laminated rules that were on the back of my bedroom door with my host family. And so just a few of the things that you see at the top is like our rights. So we were given breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. We were given one shower every day, preferably before 11 p.m. Um, we had internet connection, and then we also, our host mom would do our laundry once a week, which was really nice because we were on the sixth floor of a building, and they don't have dryers, and they just hang the clothes over, like, the window, like, outside of the window, so I would have been so nervous if I had to hang all of my own clothes with, like, the fear that I would probably drop something or clothes pin something wrong, so that was really nice that our host mom was able to do that for us. And then I would also tell you to make friends so that you're always in a group when you travel. A lot of foreign countries can be safe, a lot can be dangerous, and so that's why you want to learn as much about where you're going so that you don't put yourself into any dangerous situations. And so I was able to make a lot of really cool friends on my group program because it was all NC State students going, but I have a lot of friends who have studied abroad and they talk about meeting international students from all over the world at the school that they're studying at. 
and then get familiar with your city as well. So the bottom middle picture was the bus route that we took from my host family's apartment to school. So as you can see, it basically goes across the entire city. So you have to know what bus you're taking, how much the bus is going to cost you, and what the route numbers are. And so we kind of lucked out where all of our host families were in the same area of the city. And so when we got on the bus, a few other NC State students would already have gotten on from a few previous stops up. Then we'd go one more stop and we'd pick up a few other students. And so that was really cool, but you really got to live like a local and take that commute. Like I remember we always saw the same dad and two little girls that he was taking to school every day on the bus. And so getting to see them and hear them and take the same bus route as the locals do is pretty cool. And so finally, what I say is just get out of your comfort zone and live like a local and make sure to take advantage of all the time that you have when you're abroad, because there's a lot that you can do and experience. And yeah, it'll be an, like an experience that you'll never forget. So that's a little bit about my experience living abroad with an NC State program. All right, um, oh. before I get started, does anyone have any questions for Gabriella? Oh yeah, if anybody has any questions about Spain or NC State summer programs, you can ask me now. You could also put it in the chat if you think of any questions along the way. Okay, I think we're good. And so you can- I guess I have a general question for everybody. How yeah. did you like, uh, finance it? So my program, since it was a summer program, it was on the cheaper side because it was a shorter program. But what I did was I took advantage of NC State scholarships. So overall NC State scholarships, but then NC State has scholarships for summer in particular, and not many students will take summer classes and study abroad during the summer. So I was able to apply and get some scholarships for my summer program. Okay, well, if you have any other questions for Gabriella, I can just wait until the end. But for my side, so um, once again, I'm Enzo Molina. I'm a sophomore who's majoring in chemistry and human bio and also have a minor in sports science. So for me, it's a little different from Gabriella because I didn't study abroad. I was born abroad. I'm like currently like studying abroad kind of. Um, so I was born in France. You see the flag here. And I moved to the U.S. when I was 15 because of my dad's job. So I've been here for the past four and a half years. And um, what I wanted to tell you is um, that I was able to do it. And so that means that anybody is able to do it because I really started from nothing. And you see that even with like little to no uh, knowledge of a language, you can go out there and um, live in another country. So um, a big change for me, for example, was school because um, actually if you can show the next slide, um, this is what a usual week looked like for me in school. So in French school, we often uh, very late. So you can see that I started uh, 9 a.m. and I would end around 5.30 p.m. Then we'd have like a 45 minutes bus ride back home. Uh, then I have to have soccer practice, homework to do. It's a very different here where I was used. I mean, we're here, I started at 8 a.m., finished at 2.30, be back home at 2.35 because everything is so closed. So, that was um, one thing that you have to adjust to, and you have to know that if you go to a different place, you might have to live on a different um, schedule, just like Gabriella did. Like she um, stayed up later at night because that's how they did. She took a nap, kind of same thing here, but a little different. Another big difference for me was the language because I knew English from learning it in school. It's mandatory for um, French students to learn it starting the sixth grade, but it was like school English. It wasn't like, the real conversational. And um, when I thought, I thought I was a good speaker when I left France and I got here and I realized I really wasn't. And um, what it, the thing you have to realize is if you don't go out there and practice, you're not gonna make friends, you're not gonna learn it. So going out of the country really makes you realize that if you don't get out of your comfort zone, you're gonna be like um, alone pretty much. So it's really, it's much easier to get to know people when you are, um, from another country or from like another place, it's really easy to do that. So 
now that I've uh, been in another country for a few years, I I think I'm much more open-minded and it's easier for me to uh, talk to people. Whereas when I was um, 14, I would not really talk to anyone. I was pretty shy. So I think moving here really helped me uh, open up to people, especially people that I don't know. Uh, but you have to realize, I mean, this counts for European people, I guess, in my experience, French compared to American people. But um, the culture is very different. For example, uh, I think that in France, it's uh, pretty hard to get to know people at first. But once you know them, it's really, you're like in their life, like completely. Whereas here, I think it's really easy to meet people, but it's a little harder to get into their real life. So it can be frustrating sometimes to not really get into that like next step with people, like just to meet people in general, depending on where you're going. But it's the challenge, you know, you have to go out there and try and it's okay if you don't like succeed at first, but you always find people you get along with. Um, I should go to the next slide. So on my side, so when I moved from France, I moved uh, from Marseille, which is in the South to uh, Florida. So it was a big change for me, the, like the weather was a big change because I moved in September 2016, I think on the 28th and on October 2nd, so four days later, uh, there was Hurricane Matthew. So it was kind of like a welcome to Florida. Um, so after four days, I had to be like stranded in my, um, I think like Airbnb where I was there. So it's, um, weather is something that you might need to adjust yourself to and it, it can take a little while, but you get used to it, it's no problem. Um, the one thing I would uh, really recommend about going abroad is you get to discover so many new things. So um, I know uh, Valentina is gonna talk about it a little later, but you have a lot of opportunities to travel, especially in Europe. Um, for me, it's more like leisure, like as in soccer, if you could show the next slide, Asher. Um, for example, in Marseille, we have a big soccer team and um, it's really anchored in the city. I know in Spain also, it's a big thing, soccer. So that's some things that we don't really have as much uh, maybe here because soccer is not as big of a sport. So going in different countries, maybe in like in Asia or in uh, uh, Africa, there's different sports or different things that you would not see uh, every day here. Uh, and then there's a lot of things that you can, it can be a little hard to get used to, like the food, for example, there is, for me, it was very, really weird because when I came here, I didn't know um, refill was a thing because in France, you can only like fill your cup once and then once you're done, you're done. But um, it was kind of weird, like going to the restaurant and having someone just like fill my cup like over and over. Um, everything is much bigger. So there's a lot of things you can get used to, but if you don't go out there and do it, you'll never know what it's like. So I would really encourage uh, you guys to study abroad if you can, or just like spend a few weeks abroad. Uh, I was able to do it when I barely knew any English and I'm um, like, I'm doing pretty good. So if I could do it, you guys can do it. So this is it for me. If you guys have any questions. All right, well, uh, am I good to move on? Hey, go ahead, Valentina. So if anyone doesn't have any more questions for Enzo, um, I'll start then. So I'll reintroduce myself. My name is Valentina Vanderwarden. Um, I'm a senior at NC State and I'm studying political science, but with a concentration in international politics. I have a minor in French. Um, I speak Spanish too. Um, and I guess we'll start. So I was born in Colombia, in Bogota. Uh, can you go back? <laughs> Uh, so I was born in Colombia, and I left when I was two and for the United States directly to Miami. And then since then, it's I, I kind of I kind of look at living abroad a little bit differently, I think, than um, than would anybody else, I guess, because I feel like I've lived abroad, like even living in the United States. I started in Florida. I grew up in Michigan for about seven years, and then I moved to San Francisco and then I moved to the East Coast and then other places in between. I think that living abroad doesn't necessarily have to be like living abroad necessarily like as in like a different country. I think that it's all about like communicating with like different groups of people. And like, even if the dialect's different, you know, you go from like the North to the South, it's different, but it's like, 
you, it's like communication skills, which I'm going to stress a little bit later, but it's just like, it's about being adaptable. It's about learning independence and stuff like that. Like that, that's so important. And so I learned all of that in the States, which, you know, there's, there's like so many, there's like such a fusion of people in the United States by itself. So you get to learn that here. And so then I love that so much that um, I decided to straight out of high school, I moved to Paris. Um, I was there for a year and I was originally going to stay there for about four years, but then I decided to go to the United States for other reasons. Um, and so with that, um, my international experience started in Paris, I guess I would say. I did do a boarding school in Belgium when I was like around 14, and I was actually really scared to go because it was kind of forced upon me <laughs> a little bit. I was there for two weeks, and then I kind of realized that I loved meeting new people. Like they all spoke English, but that like they all spoke, like had different native languages and came from different places. And then I made friends there. And so I was like, I want that to be my college experience too. So I went to, you can change the slide. I went to the American University of Paris. And so the only requirement there is to speak English basically. And like, you know, obviously G GPA requirements and other things, but English was the main one. And so I ended up making so many friends from like all over the world. There's a lot of Americans there too, which was a huge benefit because I had common interests with them too, but we all kind of like, we all loved traveling and we all loved like discovering new things. And so it was such a great combination. And it wasn't like, it wasn't that many people either. It was like 2000 people. So you become like really close with everybody. It's kind of like a high school feel. That, that's actually the main reason I went to NC State. It's because I wanted like more, more people. Um, and so I did experience like a little bit of culture shock. You know, this like, I think most people are aware, like people think that French people are rude. <laughs> it's a little bit of a stereotype. And I, I think the first two weeks you kind of see that so people are a little bit like not so open at first, but then if once you start opening yourself up a little bit and like, and like seeing like, the reasons for why people do certain things, you you become adapt, you, you like adapt to it and you actually start to like, they even change what you do. And then you start to realize like, maybe what I do, you know, I might change it a little bit or something. And then you start to see that people start to open up to you. And then you have like these great conversations with strangers. And then it's just like, it, it just, everything changes once you start like opening up and start to see that, you know, it's okay that other people are different. And then you, you make more friends, more connections. And so my day-to-day -day life was basically just, it consisted of a lot of walking, to be honest. I mean, like to live in an international city, like you don't have a car probably. And so you're walking around and that's how you get to like know the city more. And then you see like all the architecture, there's obviously like, the museums. Um, and then walking along the Seine was like one of my favorite things to do just enjoying like the parks and like drinking with your friends in the park studying. Um, that's mostly what I did. Um, and then if you can change the slide. Um, so I think an important thing to talk about is obviously food. And so I think, I think that a lot of people are scared to go abroad because things are so, so different. But honestly, like the bottom right picture there, like those are my favorite tacos. <laughs> In Paris like I love tacos so much like there's there's substitutes for everything in like different places in the world like there's even like there's like certain places like there's a store called Monoprix in Paris and like in France and then they have like an American section like you can find like Fruit Loops <laughs> you know you can you can you can find anything that you really want if you really look for it so I think that kind of leads to like problem solving skills down the road too it's like there's always like another option so if like, if you don't want something that's like really exotic, you don't have to eat snails. <laughs> like you can eat pasta, you know? So there's just in a little, it can be a little, a little different, but you know, there's always something that you can find to make it like more homely and you, you make it your own place wherever you go. Like just putting yourself in a new environment. It, it's not, not everything has to be different. It's just how you approach certain things. And that just goes that to me, like I, I, I've, I've really changed things about my personality. Like I think it's maybe become a way better person. I think anybody, it's like, you just learn how, how to adapt. And it's a really good thing. Um, but besides that, um, as you can see, 
Um, I've been to 17 countries as a result of studying abroad in France. Um, day to day, I mean, like we would, we would go to class, we would go out for drinks, and then we would plan weekend trips. So that's like a huge benefit of living in Europe, specifically Europe, but you, like anywhere else probably too. Um, so we would, we would go, we would travel, like I've been to Iceland, I've been to Prague, I've been to um, Barcelona, Berlin, I've been many other places. Um, but that's such a huge benefit, like transportation wise, like it's actually really cheap. Um, that's something that people don't seem to know is that, um, I mean, you can buy like a, a train ticket for like 10 euros sometimes, 15 euros, you just have to look. Even plane tickets, like I bought one for like 30 euros. Um, and then you can just stay like in a hostel. Um, besides that, like career opportunities, I've found that like, I, I personally like, I'm really interested in international stuff and like law and like organizations like NATO. Um, and then I met someone in Paris who gave me an internship at NATO and I ended up doing that. So it's like, sometimes just the strangest things, like the strangest situations that you find yourself like abroad or even here, like if you just give these common interests, like, oh, I love Paris, that person loved Paris. And then I ended up with a great internship. So it's like, it's, you just, you just keep on like, the more you learn like about different things, which ties in with like being international or like having experiences that really, really does help you like career-wise. Um, and I think that's all I have, really. If anyone has any questions. Okay, I'll answer that. Okay, so Akira said, I assume certain phrases and words are picked up while studying abroad, of course. Um, I, I think other people would, would say yes. <laughs> like right off the bat, I think some people would really say yes, learn some of the language beforehand. But honestly, I'm kind of adventurous like that. So like if I went to China, like I'll just pop myself down there and see what see what happens. But um, I I would say yes. I would say learn a little bit, but also just like meeting new people there and 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 maybe saying like just I <laughs> I don't know. I I'd say probably yes. That's that's probably the smarter thing to do. Um, language classes, I, I have taken French almost all my life, so it wasn't that much of an issue. I actually ended up, uh, think, like, bettering it a, a lot there. Was it difficult, was it difficult for you to balance school load and weekend trips? Um, no, because I chose to have no classes on Fridays, so it was pretty great. And then, um, we would sometimes just take it with us and do it there at the Airbnb or hostel, so it wasn't too bad. It worked out. Any more questions? And if other ambassadors want to address those questions too, uh, you guys can give your input on that as well. Um, I was going to say just that some programs require you to have a certain level in the language, maybe like A2, A1, B1, but some really don't. So it's not really like something mandatory that you have to know, like you don't need to know how to speak Czech if you're going to Prague. It's totally okay. So it's really up to you. I would recommend uh, learning like at least the basics to be like polite towards the people that are hosting you so like when you go somewhere they like learn say hello thank you like um just a few things to at least um be polite but other than that it would be the smart thing to do but it's not recommend like required <laughs> yeah it's it, it's just it's a smart thing to do but you know <laughs> Um, I can also add on to what Enzo is saying. So the program that I did was a language and culture program. So my program did have a requirement. You had to have the 200 level of the language. And while I was there, I took one culture class and one grammar class. So we were learning more of the language while we were there. But you also pick it up from your host family, too, and just conversing outside of the classroom as well. Uh, yeah, just to touch on, like, the language tidbit, like, if you're planning on going to like the Middle East or Asia, I would definitely like learn to read like some of the more basic phrases because like you're in the bus station or like in the subway, like, and you see like these crazy characters, like you, you sometimes like really do want to know what those mean. <laughs> um, when you're ordering food too, especially, it's really important to be able to uh, just like pick out like certain phrases as well. Um, I think it's important to say like, 
if you're if you're doubting like studying abroad or like going somewhere traveling somewhere like like maybe Asia or somewhere somewhere where it's like less people speak English like don't I wouldn't say let it stop you there's always solutions I mean like if if you I had a roommate for example like I had a roommate she was American she was from California and she didn't even want to be there in Paris like it was she just did it because it was a program to get into USC but she had she she had no desire to learn French at all and like just refused so it's like I mean, if you really don't want to learn the language, I would say it's not a problem, but I, I would, I would recommend, I would recommend for it for sure. Um, and then Akira had another question. Was there a point while studying abroad where you second guessed your choice? Um, so that's, I did decide to go back to NC State for sophomore year. Um, I never sec, I never second guessed being there. It was the, by far the best experience of my whole life, for sure. I loved every second of it. I actually wish I had kind of continued there. Um, I just wanted the American college experience and a little bit more options for getting more classes. Um, but no, I, I loved every second of it. Any more questions? Really good questions though, like really. Yeah. Am I like good to move on? Yeah, I think so. And then, yeah, if you guys have any more questions, uh, you can always type them in the chat, too, just while they're going. Um, I guess I'll reintroduce myself. My name is Asher Zhang. Um, I'm currently a junior at State, and I study psychology and sociology. Um, so my experience abroad was a full semester in Taiwan, and um, through my childhood, I spent summers in Asia, and I'd go to like China, Hong Kong, and then one time I visited Japan. Um, so starting off, I guess I'll tell you a little bit about Taiwan. Taiwan is this like small island nation off the coast of China. Um, there's some debate as to whether or not it's like a country, but you know, it's kind of its own thing right now. Um, it's primarily Mandarin speaking, but there's different uh, ethnic groups. There's indigenous groups, um, and they different they, they speak like different dialects of Chinese, uh, but it's most Mandarin. Um, since Taiwan spent like, a little bit of time colonized by Japan, it, it's, its culture is like this like, really weird mix of like uh, Chinese and Japanese culture. Um, and if you like, like look hard enough, you'll be able to like catch little tidbits of like Japanese people sometimes speak um, or like some of the mannerisms. Um, I lived in the main urban center of Taipei. Um, and like a little fun tidbit is I actually lived there uh, during the start of the pandemic. So I got to live like my best urban life while all my friends were stuck at home. And um, and it, it was pretty interesting because I took public health classes and like my professor would be like, okay, I think we're gonna ban travel from the US. And then like a week later they would actually do it. And then he would like explain why they did it. Um, so that was pretty interesting. Uh, Taipei is like extremely walkable, has really good transportation, but also it's like incredibly safe. Um, like you could stumble around at night, nobody will bother you at all. Um, the people there are also like extremely nice. Like during the six months I was there, I never once was, you know, like made uncomfortable by somebody. Um, the buildings in Taipei are like extremely bleak, but it's really well contrasted with how colorful the temples are, uh, especially at night. Um, Taiwan has like this really religious undertone to it. Um, but it's it's not in like the same way where people are religious here. It's more like uh, you can kind of just tell like from their mannerisms and um, just like what their beliefs are. Um, Taiwan is like it's a subtropical island, so it sometimes really does feel like you're in a jungle. It's so hot and humid, um, but you, there's really fresh fruits and vegetables and really good tea. Um, the food there is just so good. And they have like this like takeout culture there. So it's a little bit more expensive to actually make food than to buy food there. Um, and since time to process a lot of sugar, most of the foods there have like a really sweet taste to it. Uh, among Chinese people, Taiwan is really known for their night markets and their like small desserts and small snacks. Um, their night markets are these like crazy, sometimes it spans like entire just like streets and it's just like filled to the brim with like shops uh, just food and like sometimes like clothes and small trinkets. Um, yeah, although Taipei is really urban, you can always like sort of 
do a lot of nature related activities. So like you can take the subway um, to the mountains for the day, hike for a little bit, and then just Uber back or something. It's really, it's like a good mix of just like urban and just rural related activities. Um, okay. So I, I guess I'll reference some of the pictures. Top left is, it's like the small town called Jilfin. It's like, it, it's known as like the Spirited Away Village uh, because it kind of looks like it's from like Spirited Away, but Miyazaki actually like never really referenced it. So I don't know why people call it that, but it's really pretty. Um, down like in the middle is uh, Freedom Square. So that's like, it, it's, it's just nice and symbolic. Um, top right is Taipei 101. It's like their main skyscraper. Um, Taiwan doesn't really have a lot of like vertical structure because it's like prone to earthquakes. Um, but this is like, this used to be the tallest building in the world. And it's like designed with like, like earthquakes in mind specifically. So there's like this big ball that takes up four stories and it like stabilizes the building whenever they have an earthquake. Um, and then bottom right is just one of the temples I thought was like so nice. <laughs> um, a lot of the times you can find temples just like smooch between like different buildings and stuff. It's, there's just so many of them and it really plays like, like an important part in daily life there. Um, Okay, so these are just some pictures of me living my best urban life. <laughs> um, some advice that I have, I guess, like living abroad really does burst your bubble. Uh, I noticed that, like, you know, like we, we live in the US and North, like North America specifically, so it's like really isolated from a lot of different cultures. Um, but like when you interact with people from Europe, from, from Asia, from the Middle East, like, they all really bring like a different thought process to the table. Um, they all think so differently from you. And it's like, it's really interesting being able to like talk to them and like learn, learn sort of like their thought process and like just how to like engage with those people. Um, and it, it really does like change your worldview. Like when I was a kid, my entire world was like, like my neighborhood and like the two shopping centers around it. But like going abroad really does like broaden that aspect. Um, I would really watch out for culture shock. Um, I didn't have a lot of culture shock going there because I was raised um, pretty, pretty Chinese. But um, when I came back, I had serious trouble like readjusting to American lifestyle. Um, you know, I, I've kind of been like, displaced my entire life, and coming back from a place where I actually like blended in and I could speak the language um, was not epic. Uh, I actually like lost a lot of weight because I had like no interest in eating like, the food here. And um, yeah, just definitely be aware of that. Um, I would definitely familiarize with like the specific culture of the country you're going to. There are like, like I, I didn't really have to worry about it, um, but like there are some really odd like cultural tidbits, like like you just have to know, like like the siesta thing, it applies in like Taiwan too. Like everything's closed after a certain time, but it reopens for dinner. Um, just really like be respectful of like how people are living there. Um, I would strongly recommend finding like friends immediately because they really do spice things up. Um, and if you can, like I, I'm guilty of this, but try to make friends that aren't like, like American. Um, they like making friends with people who aren't like American is just like I said before. It really does like widen your worldview and it gives you like a lot of connections. Like um. I know for a fact, like, if I go to Europe now, I have, like, so many different places to stay in, like, random countries, and, like, it's, like, it's, it's just really nice, um, and then, like, I know people have said this, but get out of your comfort zone, like, I'm really comfortable as, like, a student, um, so when I went there, when I went to Taiwan, I was, like, okay, I'm gonna take all these classes, but, like, as I went on, I was, like, okay, like, I'd rather be doing things that aren't, like, school-related, so I ended up dropping, like, half of them, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so if anyone has any questions for me. Maybe you said this earlier, but I'm noticing the dates on your pictures. So when did your trip end? Where, like, were you booted back to the U.S. like as quarantine started? Like, what was, what was that like? Oh, so, uh, yeah, like, one of the questions is, like, did you ever second guess your choice? And, like, as soon as the pandemic started and, like, people started banning travel, uh, like, like, travelers from the U.S., I was like, oh, my God, 
I'm stuck. <laughs> but um, yeah, like I actually went back in July. Um, I was allowed to stay because Taipei was just like so safe compared to the rest of the world. Um, I, I went there early February and that was like when things were like starting to heat up, but we're like, oh yeah, it's like, it's chill. So I just took the plane there and then I stayed. Okay. Um, were your classes in English or like any Mandarin that switched you said the language there is? Uh, yeah, so the majority of my classes were in English. Um, they have like like a database of classes you can take that are like specifically English. Um, so a lot of them were like graduate classes because like a lot of the programs that were taught in English. Um, but you're required to take like a Chinese language class, which is conducted in Chinese. Um, as and then I, I think I like dabbled in like an applied Chinese course as well. Also, um, did you like go with NC State students? Like how, because I think there are like two types where you go with NC State students or you go to like the different university or, or you're like kind of alone more and then you get to meet more international. Um, like the people there locally do you kind of get what I'm saying. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, my program was actually like directly through like National Taiwan University. So it's not like an NC State program. Um, there was one other person from NC State. No, wait, there was two. There were two. <laughs> um, one of them had like a State Department scholarship. And then like the US government was like, we're calling all State Department operatives. And he was like, okay, I'm leaving. And then the other one just like, just left. So um, like my program or like the program specifically through like Taiwan, National Taiwan University is more like, it's more geared towards different like, um, like international students. Like it's not just like an NC State program. Like you got, you really get to like meet like the locals and like other international kids. That's really cool. Thanks. Yeah. All right, I, I guess we can move on. Um, I'm not really sure what's after this though. <laughs> okay. It's a plug for the DCC. So I wanted to advertise this to everyone who came because if you're interested in living abroad, you should also be very interested in developing your cultural competence. So this is led by the Global Training Initi Initiative at NC State. It's one of the offices under the Office of Global Engagement. And it also partners with the Schema Business School. So a lot of the French students that are in the Schema Business School also take part in that. So I'm actually currently participating in it. This Thursday is going to be my last session. And so there's four sessions in a month. And so you have one class a week and you get to really learn about a lot of cool things and about your own culture, about other people's cultures, and also get to interact with the international students. And so I wanted to add this here. Feel free to take a picture of it if you're interested, but you can go to that website that's in the bottom right and sign up. And there's three different offerings in March. So you could choose Mondays, Tuesdays, or Thursdays, whichever day fits your schedule best. Then in April, there's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And I believe this month there was Wednesday and Thursdays, but if one day Wednesday works better for you than Thursday, you're also allowed to go and attend a different session. So it's very flexible. It's really cool. I've enjoyed it a lot and you get an amazing certificate at the end of the program. So definitely check it out if you guys are interested. Yeah, the DCC is a really good program. Um, and like Gabriella said, we're happy to plug it because it's like, it's highly recommended. I think, uh, Several of our ambassadors have gone through it themselves, and uh, it's a really good opportunity. Um, so yeah, and then also we don't have a slide for this, but to plug ourselves, we have uh, global ambassador applications opening up soon. I think either like later March or early April. Let me get, let's see. I think it's, uh, let's see. Yeah, I think it's April, maybe late March. Late March. Um, so if you guys- Mid-March. Mid-March. Thank you, David. Um, so if you guys are interested in that, just keep a lookout 